Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the stage at Pure for this extremely prestigious conversation with one of the legends of UK fashion retailing. It's a great privilege for me to see my old friend George Davis, who I've known for over 40 years. Uh, we're here to discuss um, some of his many triumphs over his career. But before we start, I just want to point out that George is still very busy with his design studio and his latest uh, fashion collection, women's wear collection, called GWD, is over in that direction on E77. So just before we get going on the general discussion, I'd like to bring out some models. Do we have any models in the back there? I was told we did, but they're not here. They've gone, they've gone. Okay, well they might appear. So, let me just see. All right, here we go. So, uh, 41 years ago, I was a young reporter on uh, Draper's Record, as it then was, and I was sent to Leicester to, uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Coming through, ladies. So, George. Thank you. Tell us about GWD, George. Uh, it's a retail brand, which I don't currently sell in this country, but I've got 70 stores uh, in the Middle East. Okay. Um, me, well, about... 20 ladies and 70 kids. Um, we're probably the number one in the Middle East on children's rights. Okay. And this is your second season here at Pure, so we're wholesaling now. Yeah. We're here because all the youngsters in my <laughs> business, including my daughters, know far more about online than I ever will. So they were keen, and that's why we're here. Okay. Splendid. Ladies, thank you very much. Thank you. you can all go and have a cup of coffee or a <laughs> pint of Guinness or whatever you do. Okay, right, um, so let's get cracking on. We've got a lot to get through. Um, I've got about an hour. I'm going to put my watch down so I can keep going. So, um, George, tell us very briefly how you, uh, what your career was like, the early days of George Davis in the fashion business. Give us the short version. So what did you do before you were hired by Hepworths? Uh, well, I started, I went to university in Birmingham and um, after a year they kicked me out and said I'll never be a dentist. And I was delighted with that because I didn't want to go, but in those days your mother told you what to do. Um, thereafter, when I came back, I started working for Littlewoods. Um, you know, who were a big retailer. And over those years, although they were tough, uh, at 23, I was working in Hong Kong. They also trained me to go in all the Yorkshire factories that did wool, all the Lancashire factories that did cotton, and the Midlands had uh, knitwear. Yeah. So I could never give anybody that grounding. And it was after that, I started my own business. And then, out of the blue, I could see there was a real opportunity for school care because comprehensives were starting to come about. And I borrowed some money. I don't mind saying this from Northern Commercial Trust in Manchester, cabinet minister on the board. And would you believe, Oh, I was doing really well, and after two years or something, the bank went bust, which meant um, they took all my money. So I was stuffed. And, but I, what, what I did learn from that, I've never ever borrowed a penny from a bank in my life. And that was a, probably the best lesson. And after that, that's when I moved the idea down to a company called Pivot Day. And it was years later that 
I, I got people knew me well. I was traveling all over the world. And then I was approached by this company called Hepworth, who actually were the people, I started the brand and it was called Next. And that did amazing. And it's still the number one. The only thing that happened to me in probably in the late 80s, 89, the board didn't like me because I used to go and eat with everybody in the canteen. I don't believe, I've never said people work for me. I talk about colleagues and I say colleagues work with me. And I think what I loved, and this is the bit I miss, I used to visit 60, 70 stores a year. Okay, I had a helicopter, but it meant I could get round because that's where you learn. You learn from your colleagues and you learn from customers. And that's the love of my life, what I miss now. Um, it's quite tricky where I am in the Middle East to speak the languages. Sometimes they speak English, but that was the making of me. And um, here I am today. I'm very pleased you are. So I can see there's quite a lot of you who are not old enough to remember when Next arrived. So to give you a very quick background, Hepworths was a big... Uh, menswear business based in Leeds. They didn't have a womenswear business. They acquired a chain of raincoat shops and they hired this man to change that, that chain into a new concept. And what the new concept was, was next. I don't know if you can see down there, George, but I've got some old clippings. No, I can't. So, so, um, I can't see it. You can't see it, okay. So, um, I'll just whip through these. So, the in February 1982, on a Friday, the Friday that my feature appeared, um, the first seven uh, next shops, women's wear shops, opened, and there was a fantastically well-organized opening plan, and all these um, Kendall's uh, rain, raincoat shops were converted into next. And I think somewhere, just bear with me, yeah, hang on, these are all George. Yeah, that was some, that was the, um, how quickly they were managed to open. And the whole approach of a coordinated women's wear presentation on the high street literally revolutionized the way the UK women shopped. And then a couple of years later, as we saw back here, oops, sorry. George did the same thing with menswear. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, George, isn't it, to kind of get over to people how big the change was that you brought about, you and your team. Because you always talk about your team. You never claim you did it all. You, but you put together the team that made it happen. Yeah, I had a very good team. And I always had. And I think I told you the, the times other directors in the business didn't like the fact that I'd queue up for my lunch. Yeah, you yeah. know, things like that. Yeah. But I'm a normal person and I've always been. And that's why if you look at some of the other people who've done on the high street, they don't live here. Yeah. They live in somewhere yeah. places where you don't pay tax. <laughs> yeah. The other thing about George is he often when he's moved around doing his different things, the same people have moved moved with him. Yeah. I just want to just want to talk about another thing which I thought was very typical. So next was a high street concept and one of George's real strengths is having very good merchandise at a very fair price. So not necessarily a low price, but really, really good value in its classic sense. Would that be, would that be a fair? Yeah, but what was quite interesting, even though later on I worked with M&S, because I was growing with next, M&S blocked off my manufacturers in England. Okay. And it was, in some respects, you look back, it was the best thing they'd ever done to me because I was the first to then find, I never call them, I call them manufacturing partners. And I don't change because I can get 10p cheaper. And that's what's really helped me in business, having those partners all those years, all over the world. And, um, 
I'm very loyal to them. A lot of people will chop, chop and change just to send 15p. I don't. So that, through MS treating me like that, allowed me to have a multinational uh, business. Yeah, I think the other thing I ought to say about about George and there's you know there's a there's a few industry leaders like him of a certain generation. He's a fantastic product guy, not an accountant. So what you get with George is you get fantastic product, and that to me is what the fashion business is all about. Give the give the right product at the right price. I won't say it will sell itself, but that's that's a big part of it. And as George says, too many people sort of say, I've got to make this at a price, and then they're cutting corners and it doesn't work. This is not what George does. I just wanted to highlight, George, when you launched Next, I thought you were very cheeky, because for a high street chain, they went into Vogue, and they took six or eight pages in Vogue with these fantastic high quality pictures showing the lifestyle coordination that Next Women's Wear was presenting. And I know it sounds really silly to say that it really wasn't around at the time, but it wasn't around at the time. So there's a few pages here. Yeah, all, everything was merchandised beautifully in store, which the old things used to be, all the coats would be together, all the skirts together, all the trousers, all the blouses. When you went into Next, your outfits were already created there. Okay, so, for your next trick, having done women's wear on the high street, George, done men's wear on the high street, you then turned your attention to mail order, which was, of course, another place that you'd worked, because were you working on the Littlewoods mail order side when you were with Littlewoods? No. No, you were just on the high street side. Yeah. So tell us, because now we'll come on to um, online shopping in general, but tell us what, what the idea was with Next Directory, which revolutionized mail order, as we used to call it, um, as much as your Next did on the high street. Yeah, but I think what, because as a person, I'm very aware of what's happening, and I could tell you, I, I can't remember now, how many cars were on the road, mm -hmm. and that was growing, and I could see that's gonna be difficult for people going into towns. And towns have never, fathomed it out, and that I thought, and I always remember looking at La Radoute, which is a French catalog, and they were delivering in about 14 days. So I set myself the challenge of delivering in 48 hours, and nobody had ever done that, and that's what I did, and I delivered in 48 hours, and it just took off. But the thing about, that was so, interesting. I had a catalogue, but I actually had swatches in the catalogue that you could actually see the men's jacket. I've got, them up, got them up there. So these were physical swatches of cloth. And, but even after I'd left next, they didn't keep that up. I mean, they're still carrying on, the far bigger than Marks and Spencer's, but it was something unique and I enjoyed. Yeah, but once again, I mean, there were, I mean, catalogues, mail order catalogues were probably nearly 100 years old at that stage. It was nothing new, but they were always viewed as fairly down market, and they were viewed as places where people who didn't have money could shop because you could pay in installments, and credit was very hard to get in the old days. But what George did with the next directory was to turn all those concepts on the head, and he made... As you can see here, he made the catalogue look as good as a glossy magazine. So these were top models. I think that's Yasmin Le Bon, and photographed by top fashion photographers. And there was a real sense that you were getting a high quality product, not something cheap and cheerful, which is what the big, great big catalogues used to be. So. I remember my wife at the time was a very big fan of this, of this concept. But um, it's funny how things have turned out, George, now with um, so many people shopping online the whole time. Yeah, but that's all to do with parking. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It is, it's the you're parking right. that's caused it. Yeah. Um, 
And that's why, you know, after that I moved on and people said, I always remember papers in London saying, he's made the big mistake when I opened George. Yeah. But I opened it because people could go in their park, that's car, and park. And that's where I changed the world. And that was so successful. And I suppose the difference was, this time I owned the business. Yeah. So when they wanted it, they had to buy it. Okay. So on to the next stage, when George left next, very quickly, he moved on to a total 90 degree swerve, typical of the man, and he partnered with Asda, which was owned by Walmart, the big American company. No, there but wasn't, there weren't. There weren't all, no, not by at then. the start, later on. Ah, okay. And when Walmart, Walmart bought, the, bought, bought them, I left. Okay. <laughs> so you correctly identified the high street was under pressure because of increasing parking restrictions. Lots of out-of-town retail parks being set up, anchored by supermarkets. Supermarkets used to sell bits and pieces of textiles and clothing. Not very exciting. And then you saw that opportunity, George, correct? Yeah. yeah. So it was obviously a slightly lower price point, wasn't it, than what you were doing next? But did you, did you have a sort of clear view of what you No, I was always 15% cheaper. One five, 15. Yeah, yeah. So that was your vision, was it? That's what it's got to be in the supermarket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what did you start off with? Women's wear, or did you start off with men's kids, the whole lot? Um, I started with women's, moved to and kids very quickly, and then I moved to men's. Yeah. They're all good, yeah. And did, did, you, did you expect it to be as big as it became, as quickly as it became? Well, I think when you're so busy and you've got a concept and everybody seems to like it, you, you don't know, but at least whenever the, Asda spoke warm up by then, yep. wanted to buy me, I sold it. Yep. And yep, I made a lot of money. But then I wasn't going to do anything. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And then out of the blue, I bought myself a sailing boat and I was on the sailing boat, but I always felt guilty about not working. And then I got a call from London, and it was from one of the agents regarding M&S, and that's how I did Peruna. Okay. So that was, that was another an amazing uh, success. So just to give the context for people who can't remember, we're talking about nearly 25 years ago now. So uh, M&S, biggest retailer in the country, it had really been, um, I would say, sidelined by what George had done at Next. It was struggling. It was on, I don't know how many chief executives it's had, all trying to do something with it. And they went to George, and for a, a certain period, I would say about the only exciting thing about women's wear in Marks & Spencer was your Peruna. Yeah, but what I did there, which is quite interesting, the equipment they had in stores was dreadful. <laughs> and I, part of the deal, I said, I want to put equipment in. I knew a specialist in Switzerland, and that's what made the difference, because you've got to have good equipment that is flexible, because you never know, are there going to be more dresses, skirts? And that's what I did. So you're talking about the actual shop fitting, the actual yeah, yeah, yeah. merchandising units. Yeah. Because again, for those of you who don't remember, uh, Per Una had a distinctive footprint on within the, the um, M&S stores. And so you'd go through this sea of mediocrity and there would be this lovely bright, always bright, you've always had loads of colour, haven't you? And always well coordinated and just a step above. I mean, it, it was Although I worked till 2008 with them. They actually bought me out, and I carried on for the years. They bought me out in 2004. And there was always an agreed figure, because, you know, with lawyers, they wanted to say, if it doesn't work, we can fire you. So I said, that's fine, because if it does work, I can fire you. <laughs> I've always been stroppy like that. And, you know, just, so I've got the right deal, and, um, I'd say after about uh, two, four, two, five, I knew what they were going to pay me, which was, well, I have a lot of money. But that's fine. 
Did you ever fancy, I don't, I've never asked you this, George, did you ever fancy running at M&S? Running? When having the whole, the whole business. Did you ever fancy going back to being a chief exec of a big company? No. No. Never. Good. Bad enough thing here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Where, where else would you like to be on a Sunday? Okay, right. Now, okay, so we're up to about 2002 with Peruna. So just let me go. So in 2002, I was the editor of, uh, I was actually the editor-in-chief of Draper's. And we, when we launched Draper's in 2002, we did for the first time uh, the top 100 most influential people in British fashion. But we were doing proper fashion, not London Fashion Week fashion. So people actually made money and sold clothes that people could wear. And our first top 100, the number one most influential person was Mr. George Davis, as you can see there. So that was... Uh, I can't see anything, so... October, uh, that was the launch issue of Draper's, uh, October the 12th, 2002. So, and it was an, an amazing hat trick that George had done by then. So that's going back, that was 20 years work we're talking about here, which we've covered in about 20 minutes. So then the following year at Draper's, we had our Draper's Awards and we instituted a Lifetime Achievement Award. So the first person to get a Draper's Lifetime Achievement Award was this young fella, because I couldn't think of anybody more deserving, anybody who'd done such a fantastic job of changing the way the British, well, man, women and kids dress, the way the high street looked, the way mail order was running, the way big companies had to up their game to compete and so on. Do you remember much? We had quite a good evening, I seem to remember, Sorry? George. We had quite a good evening at the Draper's Awards, I seem to remember. Yes, we did. It was really Got pissed. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously I was working, so I would never do anything like that. But yeah, it was, it was, it was really good. So... Um, going back to what we were just saying, George, so both George and then Per Una, they were products of your design studio, correct? Is that how I can yes. describe it? Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about how that, how that works, and you've, you've explained a little bit that you never wanted to be, you know, beholden or being an employee anymore, but how does it, how does it work and what else have you done that we, we haven't yet touched upon? You mean the Far East, Middle East? Middle East. Well, just tell us about the, the concept with the... You've been in the Cotswolds? That's where the studio is? Yes. And who, who's, who works there besides, besides yourself? You've got family involved? I've got a couple of family males somewhere here. Um, Perseus at the back. Um, Hiding at the back. A lot of my... And I, I think I probably said this. I only ever call people colleagues, and they work with me, and I'm, whether I'm lucky, but you can't do it without having a great team, and they're brilliant. They're the ones who are going to do, hopefully, all this online, because I'm hopeless at that. Hard, hard enough to do for me to do an email. So I've got people to do it for you. Right, so... so uh Mel's one of your daughters, you've got a couple of other fam family members sometimes working with you. So you, um, the GWD, yes. which is George William Davis, for those yes. of you who don't know George's middle name. Um, tell us about what, you do with, what you've been doing in the Middle East. You've been there a wee while now, haven't you? Well, 2010, I saw an opportunity in Saudi. Um, and long story... But it was about two years ago, I, um, I decided I wouldn't continue. But just prior to that, an, another major company um, in Kuwait approached me, and that's where I've now got uh, 80 stores. 80? In Kuwait, all the countries, you know, Dubai, and that... That goes really well, but thanks to my team, you know. Okay. Is so that it? I think that's it. Okay. So you bring in uh, GW he GWD here as a, yes. as a wholesale collection. Uh, briefly, I tell you what, 
my friend on the on the desk. Could we play the video, please, and we'll have a look. I was going to ask George to explain, but let's have a look at the video first. <laughs> Tell you one other thing I can do. I'm a private, and I've done this all over the world. And I, I've hardly ever got it incorrect. I can, when I look at a lady stand up, I know exactly what size you are. <laughs> it's true. I, I can. I, I've done it on planes where the hostesses would come up to me when they check. I've done. I did it in um, Saudi. And that, that was tricky, yeah. And I'll tell you one little story. Th th these 12 women were sitting opposite me because Saudi, in those days, it was very difficult to even be in the same room. And I started off and I said 10, then there was a 12, then there was an 8, and then in front of me was a woman who was a good 22. And I thought, what the hell do I say here? I said, I said 18, she said perfectly right. <laughs> Is that it? Thanks. Thank you very much. No, no, we haven't finished yet. Sit down. We've got here for hours. Where are you going? Right. I haven't finished. I've got loads of questions. No, we don't no, need them was... anymore. All right. So go and have a look at GWD on, on E77. But we'll go back to, I want more of um, George's insight. So another thing, George, I always, liked about you was you were a product guy but you were really really on the ball about the shop environments yeah so what i've put up here i don't know how many people remember this on oxford street just at the east side of oxford circus going near the big m s george had a fantastic concept called department x Do you remember tell us about department x george um, I mean, it was unlike anything else. It was like bringing a warehouse to, to the high street, wasn't it? it? It was, yeah, quite amazing. And what I did, the, I knew all the problems in retail. Like, if you want to buy shoes, they've got to go off. And I, I put a, an automatic lift in so that if you looked at your shoes and it was a size six, I actually, or the people could press a button and bring the shoe up. So there was no, and the same with suit. It was all very automatic. Yeah. But they, after I went, um, <laughs> they didn't understand what I was yeah. doing, and yeah. that was it. But it was, 
amazing store. It, it was it was a fan, it was a fantastic store. So one of the things because of the the strength of Next Directory and the mail order, um, they brought into this shop a uh, um, I don't know what you would call it like a a clothing uh, mobile system. So all the clothes were hanging on the on a chain which yeah. whizzed, whizzed around the store. So everything was moved around. Really super it's great. You know, people talk about retail theatre. It was retail theatre, but as George has just made allusions to, it actually had a purpose. It made it a better, more efficient retail space as yeah. well. Yeah. It was, it was brilliant. So, it was so brilliant. Uh, by this time, I was the editor of uh, Fashion Weekly, and in those long-lost days, we very rarely used colour because it was too expensive, but that shop deserved colour. So, that was, that was really good. Do you fancy doing any GWD shops over here, George, or is it you learned your lesson and far too expensive? And it all depends. Okay. Uh, all depends. You, you all depends. So, anybody out there looking for a uh, experienced business partner, Mr. Mr. Davis is available. <laughs> okay. So, um, listen, I've got I've got a question for you, George. Um, when you look around the high street today, what do you think to it? I mean, you're not, you're not on the high street, so what do you think? Do you think there are good operators? Do you think it's all rubbish? Do you think it's fantastic? Who do you like? Who do you not like? No comment. No comment? Oh, very good. George Davis being unusually diplomatic. Okay, that's fine. Right, we mentioned it earlier. What do you think about the, this extraordinary growth of, of online shopping? Do you, I mean, did you ever... Is it any different, really, to mail order? Is it just mail order with a few more algorithms? Or, I mean, do you do you like the idea of online shopping for clothes and footwear, or do you, or do you like me? Do you think it's a totally weird idea and go in a shop and try it on, look at the colour, feel the fabric? I think, in a sense, because of parking difficulties, all that. That's why online's come about. The I know the return rate is pretty high, like yep. 42%, but maybe that's modern retail. It's, um, thank God I never had to do it. I mean, I know my team are doing it, but it's, it's, it's not something I enjoy. Yeah, well, I must say, my, my view, if, if companies, online companies, make it so easy for people to over-order and send back for free, then they're going to do it. I think they may be a, could be a bit more robust and say, well, make your choices a bit better. And, um, but it's, an ex it's extraordinary, but you know, I, I like to see, feel, touch, try on clothes, not just buy off a, off a screen, but what do I know? That's like, yeah? Right. Are you nearly done? Yes. Okay. Uh, right, let me just see. All right, last bit of advice, free advice from George Davis for independent boutique buyers here at Pure. What would your advice to be for anybody who's running an independent fashion boutique these days? What's, what's the George Davis formula for success in fashion? Uh, I don't have a formula. It's because... You do what you're doing and what you th th There were so many obvious things to me in the past, you know, about parking, etc. I find, I find online, I mean, I don't use it unless it's something, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. like if you bought it, buying glasses or something. Yeah. Um, I think it's really difficult for the consumer today. I wish shops would come back, um, and I know a lot of people here, and I've been at a few trade shows, and I think, I still think they're very important for me. Well, the other thing, I think what everybody could learn from you, George, is, as I said earlier, that just a concentration on the product, because if you've got the right product, somebody out there will buy it, and you've always had the right product, you've had 40 plus years of it. Right, George has obviously got going his helicopter somewhere. So I was going to open floors, questions from the floor, but if you want to go and ask him, you'll have to catch him another time. I don't time. mind if somebody wants to answer questions. You'd like a picture? Well, that, well, pictures are extra. Pictures are quite expensive pictures. 
Right. Um, has anybody got any questions to George? Not for me. I don't know anything. Yes, the lady, the man at the end. Oh, no, somebody here. over there. Somebody there. No. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hang on, hang on. Right. So for Pauna in Marks and Spencers, what made you decide to make it so different to everything else? So different. Um, well, it's pretty obvious to me that it needed some help. Um, I'd already sold George, and as I say, I was... I had a boat and I was away, and I got off this call from a company called McKinsey's. Do you remember them? Yeah. McKinsey's. And ultimately, I couldn't say I was on holiday because I've always felt guilty. And then I flew back, and um, then I met up with the managing director and the 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 other team and I obviously before I did anything I visited a lot of stores and then because um, I didn't just visit one I visited probably 50 and then I thought I could see where what I could do and I saw the gaps but the trouble with and I built up Peruna and then ultimately they, they bought it off me for a hell of a lot of money. But the point was, after I'd left, because even though after they bought it, I, I worked till 2008. But the thing was that's happened, they diluted the brand by they putting like the jeans over there with jeans. And that's not, I know how to build brands. And you can only, you, you, you look at it next, George. And that's what they, they did, and I think that's their life. But um, that's what I wouldn't have done. But it's up to them. Okay, any, anyone else? We're only here once. Sorry, lady here. I think with Pauna, what was really uh, unique about it was that it was for the real woman, but it made the real woman... Sorry. It was for the real woman. It made the real woman feel... Um, very beautiful, you know, it was a, a, a brand that you could access, but it made you feel like you were wearing something that was, you know, more higher end. And I noticed that you talked about the fact that you could identify a woman's size. Is that what you were trying to do? Because it seems to me that you were very um, at the forefront of what we call today, you know, inclusive fashion, trying to cater for the normal woman. Is that something that was always at the forefront of your mind? Is yeah. that maybe your success? Yeah, I I never wanted to, you know, make a dress and then sell it for 300 pounds. How they get away with it, I don't know, but, you know, those brands do. Uh, and, yeah, that's what you said. I want to be inclusive. And the difference is I admire women, having had four wives, <laughs> more than men. <laughs> yeah, generally. I mean, I, I, can, I can say on... George's behalf is um, I've had two, I've had two wives and uh, but, um, the George where, whatever he's done in, in these various businesses there's always something where people have, women have said to me you go in for one thing but there's other things that you can't resist so you might not you might not need them but you want them and that surely is a, is a key to success in fashion and you know, George has always been I'd say this in the nicest possible way. Totally unpretentious. You can see what his he was see what he's like. He's a hugely successful guy, and he's still a lovely man. And it was always about just giving the right product for a very very wide audience, not being uh, full of pretentious nonsense like so much of the fashion businesses. I think the only thing I'd say, and this, you know, I was talking about retailing, but because I've been able to make some money. I've got a massive charity and I've learned a lot about charities and um, for instance in Leicester I've where I I don't just give 
I get involved. So anybody who works um, on the diabetes side, and because it's, you know, as you know, it's very relevant diabetes. And I, the difference is, I think, with me, everybody who works on diabetes gets a birthday card from me on, online. And everybody who works anywhere in the world gets a birthday card. You know, because you can do it with email. And they're the things that are important to me, people. Thank you very much for listening. I love Thanks, you all, even, you the, even the men. <laughs> Thank you. George, George and I will be back here in 20 years' time to catch up with what he's been doing since then. Thank you, George. Nice it's, to see it's you. It's only water. It's only water, unfortunately. <laughs>